OK, welcome to Computer Science 6980. Um, I am going to read through all the introductory lecture uh, materials that I've posted on D2L and the syllabus and everything. Um, half of that is for your benefit. Half of it is for my benefit so that if I see anything wrong, um, I will see it as I read it to you and I can correct it now rather than three quarters of the way through the course. You say, oh, but you said the final was worth 20%, not 30%. So I'll, I'll see all of that now as I'm going through it. Um, and just a quick note, if you see uh, and you will see references to Computer Science 3200 throughout this course, that's the undergraduate version of this course. And so rather than make two completely separate sets of PowerPoint slides, all the slides are going to say 3200. It's, it's the same course. It's just this has a bit more stuff into it. So this has 10 to 20 percent more lecture material as well as harder assignments um, and exams. Okay? So this is an undergraduate course, Computer Science 3200, but this is the gradu grad graduate version of that course. So again, you see 3200, you're in the right place. It's still the right assignment. It's still the right lecture. It's just it's the same course. Uh, and my name is Dave Churchill, and uh, I've been teaching at MUN since 2016. And uh, my field of research is in AI and computer games, especially. I've done uh, most of my research is in what the first half of this course is about, uh, called heuristic search, so those are real-time search algorithms. I've done a little bit of uh, reinforcement learning, a little bit of machine learning, but I am certainly not as expert at machine learning as many people uh, at the university. So if you have really deep questions about machine learning, this is not a machine learning course. Believe it or not, AI existed for a long time before machine learning and will continue to exist in the future, right? So there's lots of parts of AI that are not machine learning and lots of parts that are machine learning. This is not a machine learning course. However, about a third of the course will be on reinforcement learning, which is a type of machine learning. But we'll get to that. So welcome to uh, Comp 6980, uh, Algorithmic Techniques for Artificial Intelligence. I like to just call it Intro to AI um, because we, we cover a bunch of different topics about artificial intelligence. We don't go super deep into any of them, but we do scratch the surface um, of about five or six different important um, techniques in AI. And essentially what's going to happen in this course is I'll introduce a topic, I'll teach enough of it that we can actually implement it, and then we'll have an assignment where you actually implement the thing. Because in my opinion, it, you can say that you have learned something, but you haven't truly learned it until you have implemented it from scratch. And that's what we're going to do in this class. So our, our course this term will be in-person lecturing with in-person exams. Um, here is all the info you need about the course. Uh, so here we have Tuesdays and Thursdays from right now until 3.15 in this room, C2004, and the first class is today. So congratulations to anyone who showed up. We've got about two-thirds of the registered students in the class right now. Hopefully people keep showing up. Um, the first thing that I will show you here is this Google spreadsheet, which I already have open. So this spreadsheet contains all of the information about the course in one place. And so this is more for me than it is for you because I am by nature extremely disorganized and I forget things all the time. Actually, when I drove here today, I had to go back to the house to remember to turn off this heater that I had left on. Like I'm quite disorganized, so I like to be as organized as possible um, when it comes to students. So here, for example, you can see that um, every single lecture for the term is planned out. This is subject to change. It may change, but uh, we will not have any snow days in this course. So if there is a snow day, um, for example, if there's a storm and they say there's no mon is closed today, um, I'll show you in a bit that I have many years of lecture videos saved. And so I will either record the video at home and post it, or, if it's appropriate, I will take a video from last year and post that one. So we will not have any snow days. Like, yes, there may be days where there's a storm and we won't physically come to campus, but we will not be missing any of the lectures because rearranging stuff is really annoying. So I'd rather just give you the video. So you can see, for example, here, um, the first half of the course, uh, when we go into the syllabus, we'll see it's all about this topic called search. And then we do a little bit of evolutionary computation reinforcement learning, then we talk about neural networks for a little bit at the end. So you can see here um, all the start dates and due dates of the assignments. 
And all of the assignments in this class will be submitted on D2L or Brightspace. There are already uh, assignment folders up for all of them. And wherever you see a due date, it is due at 11.59 PM on that day. Okay, so as long as you submit it on that day, you're good. And my official ironclad policy is that every hour you're late, rounded up, you lose 5%. So if you're one minute late, you lose 5%. If you're 59 minutes late, you lose 5%. So if you're going to be one minute late, you may as well be 59 minutes late, right? But, um, and the way it works is that when you submit on D2L, only the last submission is kept. I do not see any of your previous submissions. So if you think it's going coming down to the wire and you might be submitting something late, just submit what you have and then later overwrite it with, with what you fixed it, okay? So I only see the last submission and um, you can only submit a single file, so there's no way to submit a wrong file. But I'll go into that when I get into uh, the D2L part of things. Yeah, this is the spreadsheet. Um, the slides will be linked here um, after the lecture. And then I am posting the videos to YouTube, so my lectures are all publicly posted. Again, you do not appear in the lectures whatsoever. And I also upload the video file to D2L. So on D2L will be the video file. You can watch it there if you want. But I highly recommend the YouTube video because it's just easier to watch it. It's the same thing. Um, I, for example, the lectures started at 2 p.m., but there may be like, you know, 30 seconds of me getting things ready beforehand, I trim all of that off before I do it. So, um, so yeah, if you're wondering why you can't see the raw lecture capture video, I have intentionally hidden that from you so that I can download the video and edit it before, before I give it to you. Um, and you can see how long you have for each assignment, so there's no um, excuses for, oh, I thought it was due tomorrow. It's all there. So let's go back. That's the spreadsheet. That's what keeps me organized. Um, general course information. This course will make use of D2L, uh, my website, and Discord, which is optional. Um, if you've never heard of Discord, oh, I'll get to Discord in a second. All of the course content will be conveniently linked on that Google spreadsheet, which is updated after each lecture during the term. Expect things to be updated by the next day. So I, you know, sometimes I have to go get groceries and make dinner and some other things. So the lecture videos are not always posted the same day. Um, they're there so you can review them, not so you can skip all the classes. So I still recommend coming to class, but you know, if you have a job or whatever, I get it. You can just watch the videos. My goal for this term and for every term is to teach you the material. So as long as you get taught the material, I really don't care if you're in class, but I think you might get a little bit out of it, more out of it, if you do come to class. But I want to post those videos online so that you can review them. And you may think, oh, wow, he's, he's going through all that effort for us to study and stuff, because you can rewatch the lectures or whatever. To be honest, it's selfish, because I get 95% fewer questions when I post videos. So every lecture that I post a video for is probably 20 emails that I don't have to answer. So it's really like a self, it's mutually beneficial for you and for me. Uh, links to the spreadsheet and course syllabus can be found on my teaching website, which is here. So that link, I already have this open. So this is my website, and here uh, I explain that I post everything to my YouTube channel. And uh, I do not intentionally monetize my YouTube channel. That's not why I post it there. I post it there so that the lectures are easily viewable and because I can upload an infinite amount of video there. Um, but just be, just be aware that YouTube, I've tried to turn this off, but you can't. It will insert ads in some of the videos. I am not affiliated with those ads whatsoever. If you get ads for Coca-Cola, I drink Pepsi. It's not, you know, I, I, I'm not affiliated with any of that stuff. Um, and like the $10 of ad revenue that I make in a year just goes towards me buying a new microphone or something. You know, like it's, I'm not, that's not my side hustle or anything like that. Um, so here I list my current courses. So this is the course that I'm teaching. I link to the spreadsheet. I link to the YouTube playlist that will be created once a video is up. Right now there's no link there, but uh, it will once the, once the video goes up. And all of my past courses that I've taught um, I did this last week, I, I redid my website. So every single offering of every course I've ever done, and if it has a spreadsheet, and if it has lecture videos, they will be there. Um, so for example, these lecture videos for past offerings of 6980, 
That's when this course was a piggybacked course with 3200. So these lectures right here, so for example, 6980, uh, fall 2021, this playlist is the same playlist as this playlist because that was literally the same lectures. So we used to have this course before engineering got involved and redid the scheduling. Um, I used to just teach one set of lectures for both courses, so that's there. So, I mean, you can go watch a bunch of the course if you want to in advance. However, keep in mind that there are big changes this year. So, for example, in previous years, we used JavaScript in this course. This year, you're my guinea pigs for using C++ for this course. Okay? Don't roll your eyes. You'll learn more, and it'll be great. And if you go back to the spreadsheet, people were emailing me, oh, I don't know C++. The undergrads in my game programming course can learn C++, so you can learn a little bit of C++ as well. And they need to know a lot more C++. So here are my intro to C++. There's two lectures on intro to C++ from my game programming class. Feel free to watch those. Um, I will have expected you to watch those at the point that assignment one lecture happens. Okay? So if you haven't watched those, then the assignment one lecture may have things that you're not familiar with. If you're already a guru in C++, you don't need to watch them, but by all means, watch them. And down here um, is a tutorial in VS Code and C++ and make files and stuff like that. So I'll get into all this when we get into assignment one, but the same code will run in Windows, Mac, and Linux. So no matter what operating system you're using, the code will still run in all of them. Just the way you compile it is slightly different. So don't worry if you've never used C++ before, it's fine. It's as easy as any other programming language. All the horror stories of C++ are from C++ 99 before modern C++ was, was invented. So, okay. What's next? Um, oh, yeah. So all my lectures are there. You can see all the syllabus and stuff. That's just, hey, if you want to learn game programming, all my lectures are there. I just like to post them publicly because I think education should be publicly available. So let's continue going down here. Um, all important course announcements will be made via D2L, so make sure to enable email notifications for D2L so you don't miss any. Somewhere in D2L, you can enable it so that whenever I post something to the course, you'll get an email, so that's what I recommend doing. Okay, something that's a little bit different, probably, um, and seems really weird at first, but it's for a reason, is that each of you will be getting an individualized copy of the assignment in this course. So normally, you know, a prof will just upload a zip file, you'll download the zip file, you'll do the assignment. In this class, we have pretty involved assignments. I have a complete, like, so let me just show you for example here. Um, this is the UI for assignment one that I have written that you will get. So it's a pathfinding assignment, it's interactive, it's got lots of cool stuff. Um, there's all sorts of different like maps that we're going to do pathfinding on. You can zoom in and zoom out. All you have to do is implement the algorithm backend. Okay, so all the UI and stuff is all done for you. Basically, all you'll need to know for C++ is like the most basic memory management, classes, for loops, variables. We're doing all this using like raw arrays and stuff. So it's it's not going to be it's not going to be too complicated. But because those assignments take so long to make. And if those assignment solutions got out there, the course would be not ruined, but it would suck. What I do is I take the assignment, which contains a number of different files, and I embed all of your personal information into those files. So, and then it's like your name, your email address, your student number, and you get sent an, a link to download the assignment so when you open it, you're like, oh, this is my copy of the assignment. And so if those assignments get posted anywhere online, I'll know who posted it online. And your personal information is also encoded in those files in ways that is not obvious. And yes, I wrote software to do all of this, but since I've done this, I haven't found any of my assignments on like Chegg or any Russian assignment selling websites. And if I do catch someone posting my assignments online, it's a zero in the course, and I go to the dean. I'm not screwing around with this, okay? So if you want to not finish grad school, post my assignments online, all right? Whatever $15 you get from some Russian website is not going to be worth it, I promise you. I'm a pretty 
fun, happy guy until it comes to posting my stuff online, right? And it's also copyrighted, so it's also copyright infringement, so just don't do it. Now, with that in mind, I realized that you can use GitHub if you want to collaborate with partners on the assignments, because you'll get to work with a partner on the assignments, but it has to be a private repository. I periodically check GitHub um, for, for my code, right? I have search strings and stuff that will find my code. And if I see it there, I'm not going to automatically boot you out of the course or anything. I'm just going to say, hey, this is public. Please make it private. That's your one strike, OK? And after the course, if you want to add this stuff to like your, um, your resume or your portfolio, you cannot post the code online. You can take screenshots. You can take videos. You can have the binary. But you cannot post your solution code online for any reason at any time from here to perpetuity. OK? So please, please don't do that. It would make my day if you did not do that. I normally don't have a problem with that. But every now and then, um, someone just forgets to make their GitHub repo private. And I understand that. OK. So today or tomorrow, you will get an email. Oh, sorry. By assignment one's release date, you will get an email with links, five links. And those five links will be the links to download your assignment. And in those, uh, those links will become active as the assignments are released. So don't, like, this is not, don't worry. No one's going to get your private information if you don't send the files anywhere, right? So that's just my preemptive method. It's, it's a lot easier to stop people sharing the assignments than to fix the problem once they have shared the assignments. Now, it's fine to share it with your partner in the group, but that's it. No, nobody else. Uh, all the assignments will be submitted via D2L as a single. This says a zip file. It's not a zip file. You're just going to submit the, the HPP file. I'll get into that with assignment one. Uh, OK, look, I had a, I had a thing here. Um, so I don't need to explain that again. I forgot that I had the text there. Uh, I already explained that. All assignments will be done using C++. This is very important. No use of ChatGPT, Copilot, or any other automatic code generation software is allowed in this course for the completion of assignments. I will be treating any AI-generated code that is submitted as cheating and will pursue very harsh academic penalties for its use. Now, I understand that ChatGPT is a thing, and I use it. If I need some skeleton template code for something that I'm going to write up, hey, ChatGPT, give me that. It's way easier than going to Stack Overflow uh, I forgot how to write to a file in C++ or in Java, whatever. ChatGPT is great for that. But don't use it to solve the assignment. It, it will not be worth it. Okay? The risk that you run in me catching it is too great, and it's just really not worth it. The goal here is to learn. I know the goal for many of you is just to pay money for a piece of paper that says you have a master's. I mean, I get that. But please don't use ChatGPT. So, the thing is, people are like, well, you can't prove it You know, if we did do it. Yeah, kind of, right? So many people here probably speak a native language that's other than English, right? Like your first language may not be English. If someone has ever spoken to you in your native language who doesn't speak it natively, you can hear an accent, right? You can hear that. It's like it's very obvious that that's not their first language. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's obvious that that's not their first language. And when you submit code to me that is not done in a way that I've taught you, that comes from ChatGPT or the few websites that I know of that do similar things to my assignments, there's an accent on that code that I can see. Trust me. It's, it's, it's very obvious if you've done it in a way that was not taught in this course. I know the Wikipedia article on on the A star search algorithm. I can see it. It's, it's a, done in a very different way than I teach it. I know the different websites that go into Minimax and Alpha Beta. Like, they teach it in a very different way. Trust me, my way's better. Right? That's some guy who wrote an article for Wikipedia. I do this professionally. It's better. Trust me. So please, don't, don't cheat. Now, there are some times in a course when I release an assignment, I'll say, hey, there's this bonus part of the assignment where you can get bonus marks. right? Or some optimizations that you can do to make your code run faster. Sometimes I'll say it's OK to go online. Like, for example, there's this uh, chessprogramming.com. It's an excellent resource. And you can use that for assignment three to make your code run faster or your AI stronger or something like that. 
But that's for the bonus stuff or the optimizations. And if you do do that, I want you to cite where you got that stuff. Okay, so hey, I took this part from here. That's okay, but for just solving the assignment, please do it on your own. We check, we catch people every year. There are at least two people who do it. And the thing is, the, the catch-22 is that you don't realize, because you haven't, <laughs> I've been programming this stuff for like 20 years now, right? And you don't realize how obvious it is when you hand it in and you haven't done it yourself, right? Because you haven't been doing it long enough. So please avoid ChatGPT. Now, okay, if you have like autocomplete on in Visual Studio and you type two characters and it like fills out the line, that's fine, obviously, but no, no logic completion for you. All right. Discord server. I have a Discord server for my classes, which you can join to discuss the course. This is completely optional and not required. But even though it's not required, it's pretty active. Um, there's usually a lot of discussion there. And you are able to DM me questions. And that is by far the easiest and quickest way to get a response from me most of the time. If you join the Discord, it will definitely help you during the term and provide a better sense of overall community for the class, I think, anyway. Uh, there's the Discord invite link. That link will expire in seven days. When it, oh, actually, I posted it two days ago. So that will expire in five days. So join the Discord if you know. When assignment one is released is usually when most people join the Discord. Or actually, the day before assignment one is due is usually when most people join the Discord. So if the link has expired, just send me an email. I'll post a new link. Um, and uh, when you do, do join the Discord server, please set your nickname in Discord to your real name. So I know who you're talking to, because I get a question from 420blazeitxx. And like I, I don't know who that is. right? I want to know who I'm talking to so that I can um, correctly answer your question. And importantly, as I already said on the Discord, if you have a general question, and a general question meaning something that does not involve you personally, ask it in the general channel. Like, hey, uh, for assignment one, do you, did you mean this? That goes in the general channel so that I can answer it for everybody. But if it's, hey, I, I get an error and I don't know what the error means, and I've been trying it for 10 hours, please help me. You know, that actually, the error message could go in the general channel as well. But like, here's my solution. It doesn't work. What is it? Then that you would post in a DM. Okay? Or why did I get a 60 on assignment one? That, that could be in a DM. But for general questions, please, it's just, you know, every question you send in a DM that's not personal is like, I get 50 of those rather than just once in the, in the general channel. All right, lecturely, lecture delivery information. All the lectures will be delivered in person in the classroom. All lectures will be recorded by MUN's in-class lecture capture system. All lecture videos will be posted to YouTube, D2L, and linked in the course spreadsheet. All lecture slides and videos will be available on D2L and linked in the course spreadsheet. I will not miss any scheduled lectures. It's, if there's a school closure or I'm sick and I can't make a lecture, I will post uh, a video as a replacement for that lecture. Um, this class will have an in-person midterm and an in-person final exam. Writing a midterm in this room is going to be absolutely horrendous. Um, I'll do my best to rectify that problem. Okay? If we do have to write the midterm here, come early and get one of those seats. <laughs> uh, that's, that's all I can do. This is where they put me. Programming in C++. Uh, oh, and I don't schedule the final exam. The university schedules the final exam. So if it's at 9 a.m. on a Monday, I apologize in advance. That is when my last three exams in this course have been scheduled for. I don't want to get up at 7 a.m. just as much as you don't want to. Um, but we'll see um, when that gets scheduled. If you're unfamiliar with C++, I've posted on the spreadsheet three tutorial videos that I made for other courses. Please feel free to watch those to get up to speed with general C++ knowledge. The setup of the programming environment will be covered in the assignment one lecture. So there's plenty of time to do assignment one. Um, go watch those C++ videos before assignment one, and I'll go over a very detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to set it up for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And once we're done that initial setup, um, you'll be good for the rest of the course. And assignment one, algorithmically, is dead simple. It's like assignment one is basically getting used to C++, getting used to the programming environment, 
So the, like, the actual thinking that has to be done on assignment one is, in order to get full marks, is very little. But in order to have a fast assignment, which we'll talk about later, is, is there's going to be a lot of thinking to, to have a fast assignment. And each of my assignments have an informal competition in class, and I will list the top three fastest running solutions um, in the class. So it doesn't get you any bonus marks, but you will have all that street cred when you're walking down the hallway in the engineering building, right? So, and, and trust me, you will spend 90% of the time trying to optimize the assignment to get faster. Like, the actual do, actually doing the assignment is not that bad. It's the wanting it to be fast. That's the, that's the problem part. Okay, so that was it for here. Um, any questions or anything that I may have missed so far about the course? Oh, okay. So that's the D2L post. This is the teaching website. This is the spreadsheet. Um, oh, the syllabus. Yes, we will look at the syllabus now. So where are we? We are right here. I think I posted this. This is available on D2L as well. I just posted it here. So I'll only say the things that are new. Um, this is my name. Uh, this is my official name. Most people call me Dave. Uh, I know some people say sir or professor or whatever. I'm completely fine with Dave. We are both human beings that have names. Just call me by my name. Um, my office is in the Earth Science Building. So ER is Earth Science, um, which is the one. So if you walk out of the engineering building through over the, the overpass into that next building, the main atrium or whatever in the Earth Science Building, you go to the main elevator, the one that takes you down to the parking garage. You go up to the sixth floor, you turn left. That's where my office is. Um, this is my office telephone number. I'm never there. Don't, don't use the phone number. I just, just use my email. So email me here. Um, yes, this is not my mon, uh, address. My Gmail gets to me much faster, so I highly recommend using the Gmail. This is a link to my website. That's the link to my teaching stuff. Uh, this course is an introduction to artificial intelligence covering algorithmic techniques and data structures used in modern problem-solving environments. Each topic will have a related assignment where the learned techniques are applied to simple games. OK, so here's a bit of a course outline. I don't need to read that to you. You can go read that if you want. But basically, uh, this is the first half of the course. Uh, this is one lecture <laughs> and an assignment. Then this is a number of lectures and an assignment. And then I touch on neural networks. And neural networks will be on the final, but they won't be, there won't be an assignment on, on neural networks. Um, optional textbook, uh, this artificial intelligence, a modern approach. That is um, what the first half of the course is based on. So feel free to read along in that. You don't need it. I design my courses so that you can study from the slides and get 100 in the exams. Okay, So yes, it'll make you understand more, but uh, you don't need it. And then this is for the second half of the course. I do recommend reading the relevant chapters for this book. It is the best textbook I've ever read. I was lucky enough to have been taught reinforcement learning by Rich Sutton at the University of Alberta when I did my PhD. The book is amazing. I would highly recommend reading, uh, reading it. It is available for free online as HTML and PDF. Uh, yeah, you've already seen this. Here is the evaluation. So we'll have 50% assignments, 20% midterm, and 30% final. So it's split down the middle, 50% uh, assignments, 50% exams. What I may do, I'll announce this after the midterm, sometimes people need you know, an extra 5% or something to keep their average, to keep their funding, whatever. Um, what I've done in the past is that there's like an optional project in the course. I don't officially list it, but if that happens again, it's a way for you to get up to 10 extra marks in the course up to 95%. So if you have a 90, you can't get to 100 because you didn't get everything right. Nobody gets a free 100, okay? But you can get an extra 10 up to 95. So if, you've, if you need a 75 to get your funding and you've got like a 68 in the course, you can do the project to bump you up to a 75. But if that happens, I'll, I'll get to that. But it's not a required part of the course. 
Um, assignments can be done in up to two people per group. Uh, sorry, uh, you can do it solo or you can do it with a partner. And you do not have to have the same partner every time, but it kind of makes sense to have the same partner every time. I do not assign groups, so just look around, say hello, shake some hands, get a partner if you want a partner. Just keep in mind that the assignments have been designed as enough work for two people. Okay? They're not an insane amount of work. Um, assignment two is definitely the most work um, in terms of like actual programming. There's the most stuff to do in the second assignment. Um, what I would actually recommend is do assignment one by yourself. If you felt like, and I mean you can do assignment one in a group, but if you're not sure if you want a partner, do assignment one. If you felt, holy crap, that was a lot, uh, get a partner. If not, then you can probably do the assignments on your own. But I highly recommend getting with a partner because sometimes the sum, what is it? The sum is greater than the parts. Or so, you know, like you can, you can do more than twice the work with two people sometimes. Sometimes not, but sometimes yes. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the marking structure. Um, I take academic misconduct very seriously. So one of the lines that I like to say is, there is an excuse to miss a lecture, right? There's always an excuse to not come to class. There's always, there's sometimes there's excuses for not submitting assignments. There's excuses. There's reasons for getting things wrong. There's reasons for failing. But there's never a reason to cheat, okay? Because A, it sells yourself short because ideally you'd want to be better at the thing, right? So that's why you're doing a master's, hopefully. Some of you I know, you're just getting a master's to get more money at a job. That's understandable. But when you go to that interview and you don't have ChatGPT with you, good luck, right? And the person who didn't use ChatGPT is going to get the job and you're not because they knew it better. So please, please do it all yourself. Um, and like I said, I'm very lenient. Like if you, uh, okay, let me, let me state this officially in the first lecture. Google, Google activated. I, thought, I put it on do not disturb, so that's weird. All right. If you come to me on the day the assignment is due and ask for an extension, the answer is no. But everybody in the class gets one free extension, 48 hours, for any assignment. OK? So. This is, of course, if you get into a car accident or you're deathly ill, you, uh, you get the medical note, of course. But no questions asked, one time get out of jail free, 48 hour assignment extension for everybody. I'll keep track of it. For that, you can come to me 10 minutes before the assignment is due and say, hey, I'm using my, my get out of jail free card. Okay? But it's once. There's no other extensions unless you're gravely ill. So you just get one. Don't use it on assignment one. Assignment one is not worth as much as the other assignments, right? But that's it. That's, that's, that's the compromise, okay? Rather than every, you know, every assignment I have five people come to me, oh, can I have this, can I have that, my dog, whatever, this. Just you get one 48-hour extension, okay? I'll put that on D2L in writing so that it's clearer than what I just said. But one, um, one extension on the assignments. But of course, if you got COVID, if you got sick, there's a form you can fill out and we can talk about that. And I've already gone over this. Um, I'm going to give you the solution binary so that you can run the solution to see how it looks. I've had people try and reverse engineer the solutions. It's, what are you doing? It's so much easier to just learn how to do it rather than to like reverse engineer assembly. Like it's weird. Just, just do the assignment, yeah. Um, and then there's some legal stuff from Mon. OK, so that's the course. Um, I will post the six slash extension due date lateness stuff on D2L. I just forgot to post that before the lecture started. Any questions now that I said that? Um, so the assignments, uh, I think you get to write code. Yep. So what will be covered in the midterms and final way? If it appears, and I'll get, on, get into all this during the exams. If it appears on a slide, 
if it comes out of my mouth during a lecture or it is in an assignment, it can be on a midterm or the final. But any code that appears on any exam will be pseudocode and not a specific language. So it'll be like write the algorithm as it was on the slides in pseudocode. I don't want to see JavaScript or C++. I'm not going to say this won't compile. It'll be like the theoretical algorithm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. At any time during any lecture, if you ever have a question, just put your hand up. I'll finish the slide, and then I'll, I'll get to your question. All right. So let's get to the first lecture, um, of course. What is going on here? Slideshow, monitor, primary monitor. Is that what this is? This worked. Oh. I must have bumped the HDMI cord because I set it properly at first. There we go. Ah, oh, crap. All right. Now I have it. I, rather than using a laser pointer, because oftentimes when I'm talking, I'll be pointing at a diagram or whatever, and I did that for the first few lectures last class. But the lecture capture, it records the screen, and I'm pointing at it with a laser pointer, and so that was kind of funny. So I, I, if you see me delivering the lectures while looking at the monitor, I'm not trying to like not look at you, not interact. It's just I want you to get the laser pointer in the video so that you can um, look at it better. So lecture number one, this is just a pretty chill lecture. How much time do we have left? Half an hour. So I'll try and get through what I can in a half an hour of this. What is AI? Um, some examples, some applications of AI, et cetera. Quick note, I already went over uh, all of this, but uh, you don't need to take notes. I'm going to give you the PDF. So every time I give slides, if there are animations or videos in the slides, they will not be in the version that you get. Because you just get PDFs, okay? So because I'm not sending you like a 400 megabyte PowerPoint um, presentation, you only get the PDFs, but you can absolutely study from the PDFs, no problem. We're going to be using C++ in this course. Very little C++ knowledge is actually required to just do the assignments. But if you want to get uh, like the, you know, the fastest assignment in the class, and we'll, I'll have a whole lecture on that, so we won't get into that now. Um, beginner C++ lectures are available on the course spreadsheet. Uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux are supported. If all you have is a Chromebook, good luck. Um, actually, I have done it on a Chromebook before. Um, as far as I know, though, like the computer labs do not have the required libraries installed. So you can't do it in the computer lab. You will have to have a computer to do these assignments on. But first, and most importantly, um, there may be references to my pets. Um, in the lecture. So I'm going to go over all of my pet names. There may be a bonus question on an exam. Um, <laughs> so this is, I have four cats and two ferrets. This is Freckles. He's our outdoor cat. Uh, this is Enzo. This is Leela under the Christmas tree this year. Uh, this is Stella. This is Flash. And this is Shadow. So these are, these are my pets. I like to have fun bonus questions on exams. So. Um, Maybe, maybe. I'm not guaranteeing it, though. OK. So now on to the secondary thing, what the whole course is about, I guess. All right, so what is artificial intelligence? Um, if you ask 10 AI researchers what AI is, you'll probably get eight different answers. It has become such an overloaded term, especially in like industry marketing, that basically everybody does AI all the time, and the term doesn't mean anything anymore. Right? So if you're talking about what industry AI is, just forget that industry exists. We're going to give like the academic definition. And still, there's no one definition. Right? It's just, it's, it's weird. AI is, is a weird term. So let's break it down a bit. Uh, intelligence, you know, this may mean the capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, or problem solving. I think that's a decent definition of intelligence, at least one of the better ones that I've seen. Um, so artificial intelligence, what does the word artificial mean? Well, that's where kind of the controversy comes in. Artificial intelligence, it, nowadays, it doesn't really mean that the intelligence is artificial. 
the artificial part usually means that it doesn't come from a living being, right? Like dogs are intelligent, cats are intelligent, ferrets are intelligent, some of you are intelligent, right? Um, so artificial intelligence historically has meant it's not a human making the intelligence. But it doesn't mean that the intelligence, like if a computer beats you at chess, is that artificial intelligence? No, it's real intelligence. It beat you. Stop making excuses, right? So this means it's like building a program or a machine that appears intelligent, that's very important, um, to the user in some domain. Like intelligence is this subjective thing, right? Like intelligence to me, intelligence to a dog, intelligence to a worm are different things. It's not a defined thing. Like that's a table to anything. But intelligence is like this weird subjective thing. Then you get this notion called like strong or general AI, which is people trying to build a system that's good at everything. And despite what Google or Facebook or whoever might tell you, this, we're not even close to that. Like ChatGPT, sure, is the closest we've come, but you can very quickly get ChatGPT to make stupid statements, right? OK, so the term AI was coined by John McCarthy. Uh, a Turing Award winning computer scientist, he gave a decent definition which said, it is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It is related to the similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence, and here's the important part, but AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable. So like, if I go ask my parents what AI is, they'll say, oh, it's the Terminator. Right? It's from a movie. It's a robot. But that's because like, the only thing the, the average person knows about AI is basically, well now, ChatGPT or some computer trying to take over the world. Right? But it does not have to be things that are similar in any way, shape, or form to biology to be classified as artificial intelligence. I personally prefer the term machine intelligence because it comes from a machine and it is intelligent. And so this whole debate over artificial doesn't, doesn't even come into it with that term. Um, so artificial intelligence is the science of making computers do things that require intelligence when done by humans. Maybe that's a, another way of looking at it. What I'm trying to say is that there's no question on the exam, what is AI? It's just, it's too hard to answer. There have been like philosophical debates about this forever. It's just a weird term. But one thing we can do is sort of categorize things that are currently being done in AI. This is a really old slide now. Um, so you can categorize AI one of two different ways. One would be sort of the type of method that's being used to solve problems. And the other one would be the domain that you're trying to solve problems in. Right? So for example, you know, planning, scheduling, and optimization, those are techniques, algorithmic techniques, but um, text-to-speech might be a domain. Right? So this graph just shows, hey, there's this thing called machine learning. Right? And then there's subtopics of machine learning. There's natural language processing. There's speech. There's expert systems, planning, heuristic search, robotics, computer vision. There's all sorts of things that are done in AI. And basically, if you're doing computer science, in some way, shape, or form, you're doing AI these days. Right? So hand up if you know who this person is. Four, five, six, seven, and you call yourself computer scientists. This is Alan Turing, basically the grandfather of computer science. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, um, oh, what's the movie? Imitation, Imitation Game. It does a decent job of of doing of of talking about Alan Turing. One of the most tragic stories in modern history, in my opinion. This man basically invented computing designed one of the first actual operational computers, um, developed a computer that was able to help break German codes in World War II and basically help save millions of lives. And, but he was gay, and the British government imprisoned him for it, chemically castrated him for it, because he loved someone that they didn't want him to love. He saved the world but he liked men, crazy, um, and, and he killed himself because of it. So it's like it's absolutely tragic. Who knows where we could be now if he was still, you know, not still alive because he would have been way too old, but or maybe not, you know, still could be alive. 
but just absolutely tragic story. But one of the most important thinkers of the 20th century, um, probably, in my opinion, the most important thinker of the 20th century. So what Alan Turing said um, in his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, and this was written, I think, in the 40s, right? Before computers, he was thinking about computing. That the definitions of machine and think are difficult. So the original question of whether or not machines can think, because this is a philosophical question, um, I believe too meaningless to deserve discussion, he said. Uh, instead, let's pose the question as a game. And this was called the imitation game. So what you have in the imitation game that Turing proposed was you have a computer and a human on the opposite side of a wall. Okay? And they have some sort of way of communicating through that wall to a human interrogator and the point being here, can the interrogator determine which is the human and which is the computer? So I'm going to, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't specify what the domain is. So for example, the Turing test is not just a single test of doing everything. You could do the Turing test in playing chess. You could do a Turing test in speech. You could do a Turing test in whatever, right? It's, can I tell if I'm doing the same thing against two people or with two, two entities, can I tell which is the human and which is the computer? And that was Alan Turing's way of saying, if you can't tell the difference, then it's past the Turing test. So for all intents and purposes, that's all we ever need to say. Right? It's as good as a human. So the Turing test, um, that is the standard interpretation of the imitation game. In fact, the original version of the imitation game was not computers. It was actually man and woman. Can you tell the difference between a man and a woman? But that's not you know, what we're getting into in this course or whether or not it's still like societally rel relevant. But it did evolve into this Turing test um, with a human versus a computer. So can computers exhibit behavior which is indistinguishable from humans? And this has been asked, like 1940 is early, sure. But like Descartes was talking about automata back in the 1600s, right? There are literally like robots that were programmed with these camshafts, like analog robots that could be programmed to handwrite notes hundreds of years ago. It's crazy. Go on YouTube, look at automata from like the 1600s, 1700s. This has been around for a long time. And so if that, if that robot is able to write a handwritten note, well, OK, it was programmed by a human to do that. So is it thinking? Well, obviously not. So why is a computer today thinking? Is it any different? It's just more complex, right? So these type of questions. And you know, Diderot talked about, hey, parrots can speak English. Are they thinking, or are they just like somehow processing, doing signal processing and repeating it, or are they thinking? Um, consciousness of machines, et cetera, et cetera. This is one uh, experiment that I like. It's called the Chinese Room Experiment. It has nothing to do with China or Mandarin or Cantonese. It's just that was the name it was given by Searle in 1980. You can replace. Um, you can replace these, this with any language. But basically, we've got someone on the left that speaks this language. right? And we've got someone on the right who speaks a different language, but does not speak the original language. In the middle, we've got a black box. These people don't know what's going on inside that black box. So this person over here writes down either you know, a word or a sentence or whatever, passes it in here. Inside this black box, it turns out there's a person with a huge book. And this book has every possible translation written in it, from first language to the second language. So what this person does is it takes the sequence of, of characters that have come in, looks it up in that book, and then takes the, sequ the sequence of characters that it corresponds to in the second language and spits it out to the second person. To the outside observers, this thing is intelligent, right? But we know that all it's doing is some sort of symbolic lookup. It just takes some time to match that symbol. OK. Yes, there has to be some sort of intelligence to actually visually match a symbol to another symbol, right? Like optical character recognition, whatever. Let's pretend that it can just do that. The person in the middle doesn't need to know either language, is what I'm saying. There's no actual translation being done. So this is, this is the thought experiment. So John Searle says, by looking up rules and performing translation, the person appears to know the language, and it appears intelligent. 
but he argues that computers do the exact same thing. Literally. They look up symbols in a big table, match it, and take the output and spit it out to you. It's literally what a computer does, right? So there's no understanding of the semantics by the computer. And so the Turing test is kind of inadequate. So John Searle is arguing about understanding. Turing is arguing about behavior. So Turing is saying, does the behavior, is the behavior indistinguishable? But other philosophers don't really care about that. They want to know if the computer understands, right? So we can look at ChatGPT and we can say, hey, explain this thing to me. And it appears to understand, right? But it's still, every computer is literally just doing that. And in some ways, we kind of are too. So are we intelligent? I don't know. So none of that's going to be on the exam. It's just like interesting to me. And I thought you find it interesting as well. So what I often do is just say, OK, what is AI is kind of a weird question. So let's just look at some of the domains that AI is used in. Right? So let's look at some of that. Every single person in this room has hopefully, probably, used some sort of GPS mapping directions. Right? I have lived in St. John's my whole life. I used to be able to drive from anywhere to anywhere without GPS when I was like you know, 20. Then GPS came along, and I've forgotten where everything is, because I just use GPS to like navigate. Right? So this type of algorithm, this pathfinding system that stores data, it's like a graph with nodes and edges. This is what assignment one and two will be on, is this sort of pathfinding. This is done in video games all the time. We have like uh, autonomous control. You know, Tesla's self-driving car is perpetually coming out next year. Um, it's you know since 2013, it's been coming out next year, next year, next year. Um, you know, we do. The goal of autonomous driving is not to be perfect. It's just to be better than humans, right? So whether or not you think autonomous driving has been achieved or not, I'm about not about to get into that that debate. But um, that's just one possible domain of AI. Uh, image and pattern recognition, has they have both been things forever. Um, over on the left here, you see this is labeled LeNet. So Le here, that stands for Jan LeCun, who is, or at least was a couple of years ago, and I haven't looked it up recently, the head of uh, Facebook AI research. And he is one of the pioneers of convolutional neural networks. And so this was done in like, the late 80s, early 90s. So convolutional neural networks have been around for a long time. And um, one of my favorite stories about like an actual success of AI, um, might get into this later, but I'm not actually a huge fan of like AI and how it's being used in the world, even though it's my um, form of research. But in the United States, every package that you send has an address written on it, right? And back in the day, many more of them used to be handwritten. Now, People don't handwrite a lot of addresses anymore. But there used to be, the numbers are somewhat correct. I may not be exactly correct. When you write the address, it goes under a scanner. And if the scanner didn't, couldn't correctly guess or with enough uh, confidence get what the address was, that package had to be read by a human. Okay? And in the US, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, there used to be at least two processing facilities in each state in the United States that were solely for humans to look at addresses and then send it on to the right place. So now there's one, not in each state, but in the entire United States, where images of addresses get sent for humans to look at because optical character recognition has gotten so good. So that's like one huge success of, um, of AI. Now, some people, especially the people in maybe the postal workers union, would say that's not a huge success because we lost tens of thousands of jobs because of that. Right? I'm, whenever I say success in this course, I do not mean success for humanity or for postal workers. I mean success from a problem solving point of view. Right? Anytime you automate anything, you're going to lose jobs. That's a, a whole other argument that I probably won't get into. Uh, over here, we're seeing uh, facial recognition technology. I personally wish that all facial recognition technology was banned, because 
other than unlocking your phone, it's basically just used to track people and do evil things by evil governments. Um, I, I really don't like facial recognition technology, but boy, is it really good. Right? There was that news story a couple of years ago where um, a woman was sitting in a theater watching a show, and security came and got her and took her out of the theater. And she was being, I don't know, they, they kicked her out. And the reason was their facial recognition system recognized her as the lawyer that was suing the company that owned the theater for something. Right? Crazy. But think about that, but in terms of like a government that doesn't like you for some reason. Right? There's a lot of that going around. I'm not going to give specific examples, um, but battery is running low. Hopefully I last another 10 minutes. Um, all right. But, you know, just I like to mention things that are going on. Healthcare. Um, computers are a lot better than humans, especially doctors, at a lot of things now. So, for example, um, telemedicine, which is on the left, that's more of a robotics problem um, than an AI problem. But, like, the ability to do remote surgeries is a thing, which is really cool. So, imagine a town that just has a robot in it instead of needing to employ, you know, a bunch of surgeons there. And so, you walk in and they can do tele telesurgery. Over here, we have uh, a field of research where brain scans of, like, potential tumors um, are being uh, identified automatically. So um, uh, Dr. Popery uh, Kartik in our department, he does uh, research that's directly related to this. So you know, when you get, when you, if you have a tumor or cancer or something in the brain or anywhere in the body, one of the ways that they treat it is by seeing how fast it's growing. Like if you've had a tumor for 10 years and it's gotten no bigger, it's not as important to treat that as you know, if it's growing very quickly. So doctors have to scan. What the relevant area, identify the tumor, and like calculate its area, see how much it's grown. And they have like entire farms of people, thousands of people whose entire job is to just circle a tumor in, in an image. That's their job, right? Eight hours a day, that's what they do. And so if that can be done more accurately and more quickly by computers, that's an, obviously an important field of research. Uh, we have robotics. So swarm robotics over here, the idea that a bunch of really dumb things together can do something smart. Um, over here we have uh, robotics where you have like a single robot that's doing something smart. And I don't know why we're teasing the robots like this. That, you know, <laughs> movies tell us not to do that. We have a musical composition. This is actually a robotic band. Um, what's it called? Eraserhead or something like that? I can't remember. But that's just playing music. But also robots have been composing music, or robots. AI has been composing music for like decades. There are entire conferences dedicated to musical composition. Of course, you know, when I first gave this slide like six years ago, um, style transfer was like the new hotness, right? So style transfer up here. I'll take an image by, by does anyone know who this is written? I don't know who drew this, like Monet or something and take a video and it can apply this style to here, or Google's deep dream. But now, of course, we have you know, all these image generation things. So because I have cats and ferrets, I was like, I wonder how, how uh, well it could draw something like this. Like, yeah, a ferret holding a magic wand, casting a spell by the ocean. Like, and it's just gotten better since now. And it's so scary. Like, draw Bruce Willis pointing a gun at my head, right? Like, you can blackmail people with, it's, it's insane. It should be, it should have not, never been invented, in my opinion. But it's here and you can't get away from it. Of course, we have ChatGPT as well, right? So if you ask it, solve my Comp 6980 assignment for me, please. It's like, I can't do that, right? Now, I'm sure you guys won't ask it so politely, but uh, please don't do that. Um, in video games, in movies, uh, something like, uh, you know, generating art, uh, Who's heard of Magic the Gathering or other similar card games, right? So these card games, collectible card games, where they have rules, you like, like Dungeons and Dragons kind of thing. Like, I think the company that owns Magic the Gathering just fired like two thirds of its art staff. Because now they're just like, hey, ChatGPT or Dolly or whatever, generate this image for me and then the artist will just like change it a little bit and they'll have their image. It's crazy. Um, Procedural content generation for video games, like give me infinite dungeons so I can play this video game forever. That's something you can do. 
Um, who's used the visual translation on their phone before? That's crazy. And that's been there for like a decade. That's, that's nuts. Um, my wife went to Spain recently and translated um, a parking sign, right? Because she didn't know, like, when can I park here? Will I get a ticket? And just, like, took a picture and it translated it for her. It was wonderful. Of course, AI, you know, take over the world, all that sort of scary stuff, you know. I'm still of the belief that uh, we just unplug it, but you know, it'll be fine, but you know, we'll see how far that takes us. And of course, um, my field of research is in game playing. Um, and we'll see that uh, games are actually important test beds for AI, but why? Well, how do we make new AI, right? Like in this course, you're going to be taught things that exist. You're not necessarily going to be making new discoveries in AI. If you're doing a thesis-based, you're going to be maybe doing something a little bit new. And if you are, how do you actually make new AI? Well, first is to identify a problem or an area to work in. Um, this is actually like not easy. Uh, I was like two months into my master's before I realized the topic I wanted to work on. It's hard to narrow down a topic if you've ever had to do something like that. So somehow identify it. Maybe it's something you're passionate about. Hey, I really like uh, not that I like cancer research, but I'm, I think it's important. I want to do this, this brain tumor stuff, or I like video games, or hey, there's good jobs in this area, or whatever reason you have, you've identified an area that you want to work in. The most important thing to do is a literature review of what exists out there. In academia, there is no such thing as second place. If someone has published something and you try to publish it, it won't get published. Or if it does because the, other, the, the reviewer didn't know that it exists, as soon as someone finds out, you'll be ruined, right? Because if, they came, if someone else has published the idea and the whole job is to generate new ideas, if your thing is not new, it basically doesn't matter, right? Because the only thing that matters is new stuff. I know someone who was five years into a PhD when his supervisor found a paper from 1990 that did what he was doing. Five years of research, gone. Do a literature review. It's brutal, trust me. Not only does it tell you what not to do, but it can give you ideas of what to do. At the end of all the papers that people write, usually it's like, hey, as a next step, we could maybe do this. And you can take those ideas and run with them. Then you develop some new techniques somehow, right? comes out of your brain. Then you, tech, you test those new techniques under the state of the art, SOTA, state of the art, under some specific controlled circumstances. So you can say, if you take this system with the old best thing, you take the exact system, take out the old thing, put in my new thing, run it again, mine is 11.9% better. Right? You make objective statements and see whether or not it's better. Then maybe you can apply the new technique to the problem in cancer detection or whatever. Okay, so this is sort of the, the way that research gets done. But how do we test new AI? How do we do that testing part? Well, one way is to play games. Some domains, like for example, image classification, have very hard and fast objective ways. Like you identified these birds at 98% accuracy, someone else did it at 92% accuracy. That's not always the case. Okay? One way that traditionally we've tested sort of bigger AI systems is to play games. And why? Because games measure intelligence in some particular domain. And in my opinion, everything is a game. Everything. Chess is a game. Mario is a game. Flappy Bird's a game. Relationships are a game. School is a game, right? Your health is a game. How much time do you want to spend at the gym versus actually enjoying life? How much time do you spend with the partner you're fighting with before you decide to keep going or break up, right? Like it's, all, it's an optimization problem. It just has more dire consequences. War is unfortunately a game. Someone is trying to win and something, someone is trying to lose. Right? And more and more, like my actual field of research for a long time is like video game characters fighting each other. Like how do you more effect, most effectively 
make robots kill each other, right? So everything is a game in some way. It's just that some games are a little bit more serious in terms of their outcome. Why is that? Well, what is a game? You have an agent in an environment, and that agent can take actions. Those actions affect the environment, and the agent has some sort of goal, whether it's defeat the opponent, move to the right, solve the puzzle, get the most points, maximize a function. This maximize a function thing is important because we have this idea in life of like greedy people versus selfless people or altruistic people, right? And we say, oh, that person isn't doing it for themselves, right? Yes, they are. The greedy person is doing it for them. The altruistic person, the philanthropist, is also doing it for them. They just have different evaluation functions. They're trying to maximize different functions, right? So everybody is very self-serving. It's just that some people have functions which take other people into account. Right? So it's, it's another way of looking at it. Some people want the most money. Some people want the biggest family. Some people want to travel the world. Some people want to just be as happy as possible. Different evaluation functions for different people. But it can be phrased in a way, and we'll get into a little bit of game theory in the course as well, as a game theoretic decision. All right, AI and games. Games can simulate the real world. We have very realistic simulations and video games these days. And in games that are complex enough, if you have success in those domains that are super complex, you can then take those techniques and apply them to other real world problems. But you didn't have to test in the real world, which is super expensive. And also, <laughs> ethics requirements are brutal. If you want to ask someone a question in a survey for your thesis, you have to get that question approved by ethics, right? Because the question may bring up some memory that makes someone sad or something. And so you really do have to like, you know, ethics is a real thing. And if, you know, you can, well, what's an example? You can kill all the StarCraft characters you want. You don't need ethics for, for that in a video game, right? But if you want to go kill mice or beetles in a biology experiment, you know, there's lots of hoops to jump through there. It's pretty cheap in comparison. Yeah, it might take a couple of thousand dollars of compute hardware, but in comparison to real, real world stuff and real ro robotics, it's, it's way cheaper. It's easy to visualize, it's intuitive, and it's also fun uh, to program, in my opinion, and to play these games. And also, it helps motivate people to learn. And um, so human versus machine has been a theme for a long time, right? Machine versus biology, you know, we used to have trains racing against horses or, uh, you know, the first uh, Model T Ford car, you know, maybe couldn't run it, go as fast as a human or something like that. And in AI, we've had that as well. As soon as machines could reason about a particular problem, researchers have wanted it to be better than the world's best human. So what have we got so far? Uh, checkers has been solved. So some of you may have heard out in you know, the real world the term solved. I solved that problem. That's not the same solved as game theory solved. When you talk about game AI or AI in general, if you have solved a problem, it means that you have the perfect solution for every possible state. So the game of checkers has been perfectly enumerated. There is a database of if you're in this state, you do this move. It's like a petabyte or so, you know, it's huge, but or not, maybe not a petabyte, but several terabytes. You can look up the perfect move in checkers. Chess, since 1997, I believe, that's when IBM's Deep Blue computer beat Garry Kasparov, the world champion. And since that moment, computers have been way faster uh, or way better than uh, humans at chess. And an AI that can run on your phone is like, double the ELO of the world's best humans. It's crazy how much better humans are. Uh, Go. Anyone in here play Go or know the rules to Go? A couple people. So Go was a problem, uh, a game that was notoriously more difficult for computers to play than games like chess or checkers because it's just, there were so many places you could put the pieces on the board. And uh, at the end of the class, we're going to watch a movie, or you're going to watch a movie, you're not going to have it in class, called AlphaGo. And that's the story of how um, Google's DeepMind 
made a program that could beat the world champion at Go. We've come close to beating um, the world's best humans at a lot of video games, but some video games are still, uh, humans are still better than, um, than AI. So StarCraft being one of those. And also, me personally, game AI is like, in itself, without even caring about cancer research or self-driving cars or surgery or any of that, it's like the video game industry is literally bigger than the movie and music industry combined. So it's an important, like if you're looking for a job in that area, or economically speaking, um, it's a huge industry, right? It's, it is a multi-hundred billion dollar industry in many different countries. And, you know, has benefits like, a lot of people think of game AI as just the AI that runs in the game. But if you think about it in a different way, you maybe create offline tools as well. If you have a game, and you have an AI that's really good at that game, so who plays games online? Wow, that's not as many as I was hoping for. But when you're playing a game online, who's ever had to download a patch right, for the game? So OK, you're playing League of Legends or Dota or Counter-Strike or whatever, and something was found to be too powerful. So there's like a balance patch. right? So this gun now costs $2 less, or that champion now deals 50% more damage. If you could have an AI that could play the game offline before you release the game, play it and find these things, imagine how good that would be rather than relying on people playing your game. So there's lots of different things. Um, in terms of AI at MUN, there may be more AI going on at MUN um, than you think. I run the MUN AI in Games Lab. Uh, I used to have four students. Currently, I two students. One of them is almost finishing. I don't have a lot of students right now. Um, but you know, we have funding from different places. Um, for a brief period, I worked with um, uh, Google DeepMind on some StarCraft II research and some, also some StarCraft research with, uh, with Facebook AI research. Um, here's some people who used to be in our lab. This is over in the engineering building. Um, I run this StarCraft competition every year. Um, it's an international AI competition. It's like people submit from, from all over the world. I'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. I won't go into to all these details. Um, we do things like uh, simulation programming. So I like writing simulators, like physical simulators, stuff like this, so that we can do things in code instead of online. This is a reinforcement learning algorithm that learned to make shapes. So this, this little blue one is pushing these red stationary pucks around to make a donut shape, and it does that using Q-learning, like a very basic form of reinforcement learning that we'll, that we'll learn in this class. Um, I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to skip through these. Uh, more simulators for games, AI for games, and uh, these are the courses that we have at the undergraduate level, at least. I didn't list the grad ones, which would have been good for you, but I forgot to change the slide. So we have this Intro to AI class, uh, 3200, Nature Inspired Computing, Intro to Machine Learning, Game Programming, AI and Games. So there's lots of, there's lots of cool AI courses at MUN, and 